Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you and have the opportunity to uh, share with you some thoughts and ideas about uh, Christianity in the marketplace today and some just really what God's been doing in my life over the last, uh, really in particular, 25 years as he's kind of led me in the marketplace and in my walk. And uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Mohan, what you're doing here at the business school and and leading this and really driving home those Christian principles in the marketplace. And Ernest, it's been a great pleasure to get to know you and spend time with you. And, and just really, I appreciate the vision that Dr. Sloan and the board has here for HBU. And, and really, uh, as I've talked with Dr. Sloan about, just the, this whole concept of Christian principles in the marketplace and what that looks like. And, and what does that look like in an institution like HBU as you prepare people to go out into the world and, and what are the values that they will... Uh, uh, carry with them as they leave this institution. So, anyway, I'm, I'm greatly honored that you're here today uh, for lunch. And uh, first thing I'll tell you is that uh, I don't know. I'm gonna get that off the stage. Uh, thanks, sirs. Uh, I, I can tell you probably more about what not to do than what to do. I, I've I've made so many mistakes in my life and in my business career. In fact, I keep a little red book. Uh, in my office at home, uh, and every year at the end of every year, I write down the mistakes I made that year. Uh, I write down some good things, you know, it's not always bad, but I write down the mistakes that I made that year and decisions that I made, et cetera, and I've kept that now for 20 plus years. And, and I'd like to tell you that, that because I review that each year and I do that, I don't make the same mistakes again, but uh, that's not the case. Uh, I tend to repeat some mistakes over and over, but I know that God's gracious and that, that he uh, is working on me. I'm a, I'm a major work in process here, so uh, I, I don't want to come across that I've got all, all this figured out because I don't, but I do want to share some thoughts and ideas, and, and, and as Ernest and I talked about that, one of the things that, that kind of hit me in talking to business people in the marketplace today is this whole idea of uncertainty. And I don't know how many of you might feel that we're in uncertain times. Do you feel like we're in uncertain times? Um, you know, I don't know how many of you are concerned about the financial position of the United States right now. Uh, how many of you are maybe concerned about the, the economic situation in Europe? and whether Germany is going to continue to support the euro or not. I don't know how many of you might be concerned that we're looking at increased tax rates here in the U.S. and a redistribution of wealth. I don't know how many of you might be concerned about the rising cost of health care in the U.S. and what we're going to do about it. Uh, we're one of the most uh, expensive health care uh, countries in the world, and yet we aren't anywhere near the top when it comes to outcome. You know, there is a lot of uncertainty out there, and so, and I hear that all the time. Uh, there's quite a bit of uncertainty right now in this election year, isn't there? And you listen to all the rhetoric and, and uh, uh, the, the comments that are made, and you see these candidates attack one another, and, and boy, it sure doesn't give you a lot of confidence, does it? I, I just uh, really... Uh, and sometimes challenged by some of the rhetoric that's, that's uh, stated. So I, I just want to share with you some ideas maybe about how we as Christians uh, might be called to have a different view of the marketplace than that which is out there in general. So if you don't mind, I'd like to open with a prayer and kind of ask God here to lead this. Lord, I just uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for these people you've called here. Now, Lord, it's no accident that any one of us are here, but it's by your divine hand that you uh, called us here this day. And, uh, Lord, I just pray that, uh, I pray you'll speak, huh, not me. Lord, and you'll speak what you want said today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, thank you for coming and, and listening to some thoughts and ideas about this topic. And, and uh, you know, I read this quote, worry is like a rocking chair. It uses up your energy without getting you anywhere. Huh? And, that, and that's really true. And, and we can get worried and concerned about what's going on in this country and what's going on. But at the end of the day, that worry and that anxiety is not going to do us any good. Um, 
You know, I think one of the things that's happened in the U.S., and I just spent a week, two couple days with these guys sitting over here to my right. I didn't even know they were going to be here. They're the ex-con guys, the ex-Conico guys. We went hunting here a few days ago. These guys ran Conico, and uh, they know what I'm going to talk about today because they are men of principle, and I can tell you that, and value. And uh, one of the things, and then even talking to those guys here last week, one of the things I think that's happened in the U.S. Is, is our founding fathers, when the Declaration of Independence was written, those that wrote the Declaration and signed the Declaration wrote that we should pursue um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness, right? Happiness. And I think we have taken that word happiness and turned it into something that they never intended the word to mean. To them, what happiness was about was freedom. It was about freedom from oppression that happiness was somehow a God-given right that every person should have. And when they wrote about happiness, that's what they meant. But in the world we live in, we've turned that word happiness into accumulation and that our happiness is somehow dependent on what we possess. And so we in America have made the pursuit of things as the solution to the void in our life and, you know, we, we go about, in fact, I don't know if you watch some of the TV shows or you listen to some, Susan and I watch a show every now and then, and we hear these young people that are searching for a mate talk about, I'm just looking for somebody that will make me happy. Well, you know, that's, that's like treating a systemic system, symptom. You know, that, that is not at the root of the issue. And our country come, somehow has moved into this idea that all I want to be is happy. Well, you know, that's never going to happen. Happiness comes and goes. You're going to be happy today if it doesn't rain, and you're going to be upset if it does rain. You're going to be happy if the dog brought the paper in, and you're not going to be happy if they didn't. Happiness is fleeting. It's a fleeting emotion. It's not what God intended for our life. I'm going to read you a quote. This was written in the early 70s about this whole concept. Whereas the American, this was written by a guy named Nestler, Whereas the American dream was once equated with certain principles of freedom, it is now equated, equated with things. The American dream has undergone a metamorphosis from principles to materialism. When people are concerned more with the attainment of things than with the maintenance of principles, it's a sign of moral decay. And it is through such decay that the loss of freedom occurs. Isn't that interesting? I think the guy got it right. It's the pursuit of materialism, that through the pursuit of materialism, and in reality, we lose freedom. You know why? Because things own you. Things will own you. The more stuff we have, the more it owns you. How many of you feel that way? You know, we, Susan and I, we have a little farm up in Brenham, and that, that thing owns us a lot. You know, it just, I don't know, pipes break, and uh, we were worried like yesterday was going to blow over, and there weren't going to be anything left up there, you know. Stuff can own you if you're not careful. And, and that's really what that guy was writing about, is that materialism has replaced this whole concept of freedom. So what's the key to certainty? And, and I think certainty in this life has much to do with our purpose and why did God put you here. I don't know, how many of you ever think about that? How many of you ever think about why in the world am I on this spinning ball of dirt? Why did God put me on this earth? What is my purpose? And I'm going to share with you a little bit about the circuitous route that God has taken me. And you'll see how messed up I am when I tell you a little bit of my story about but how gracious God has been in my life. Okay? And um, I grew up in West Texas, in a little bitty town, Del Rio, Texas, on the border of Mexico. Some of you may be familiar with Del Rio. Maybe not. It's a... Uh, there's no reason you would ever drive through it. It's, it's at the, if you go west out of Houston, when you get to Mexico, you're at Del Rio. And uh, true. My, uh, my dad was a minister there. He was a pastor. And my mother was a nurse. And they, they raised four children. And, and they taught us the value of hard work, of doing your best. Uh, boy, you never wanted to bring a bee home to my mother. You know, she was a staunch German and uh, is. And she uh, demanded that you do your best, and, and you, you did your best. You didn't want to face my mother having not done your best. 
I grew up in the shadow of an older brother who was an outstanding high school athlete. He was highly recruited all over the state. He ended up going to Baylor University and playing football. At the end of my high school career, I just kind of went through the motions of, of this thing called football in particular. That was the number one sport I played. I was going to be like my brother, probably go to Baylor, you know, play football at Baylor. But a weird thing happened when I got through with high school, none of the Southwest Conference schools came and recruited me. I just kind of assumed that Grant Taft would come to the house like he did when he was recruiting my brother and sit on the couch and tell my parents what a wonderful young man I was, and I'd end up going to Baylor. But Grant Taft never even called. And so after high school, that summer after high school, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I really didn't know. And I happened to go and I worked for an, a guy that owned some car dealers. So my parents had moved to East Texas after I graduated from high school. And I went to work for a guy named Clifton Carraway who was an Aggie. Tech, he went to Texas A&M. I had only been to an A&M's campus one time when I went and watched my brother play football there, and it happened to be the game that Tony Franklin kicked three career, uh, actually three record NCAA field goals. If you saw that game, I always remember that. But that was the only time I'd ever been on that campus. But anyway, Mr. Carraway had me go talk to the A&M coaches. I went and spoke with them. They said, why don't you come walk on with the freshman class? Now, I didn't even know what walk on was, never heard of the term. Didn't mean anything to me, but they said, why don't you come with the freshman class, you'd be a walk on. Now, two things about that. One is my girlfriend in high school, her father was an Aggie. He was a man that I greatly respected. He had huge influence on my life, and I really liked him. And I said, well, if that's, if that's what Texas A&M produces, maybe that's something I'm interested in. And secondly, my girlfriend was going there, <laughs> who is now my wife of 28 years sitting over here, Susan. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to go walk on. So I went and I walked on. I showed up at Kane Hall at Texas A&M University, 210 pounds of uh, slow, uh, uh, not very good athlete, I suppose, at Kane Hall. But I showed up and I roomed with a guy named John, and we started two-a-day practices my freshman year, and I worked really hard. I was going to make the travel team, and I told John that, and John said, he laughed at me. He was a junior. He was also a walk-on. He said, Fred, you don't understand. You're not going to be on the travel team, number one. Number two, he said, I've never even suited up for a game. He's a junior. And I was like, wow. Well, you don't understand then. And, and something kind of welled up inside me, and I told him, you're, you're wrong. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, but he was right. I didn't go on that trip. <laughs> he was exactly right. I didn't, and uh, I didn't the whole first year. But during that year, and this, I'm going to get to this whole thing of purpose, but during that year, uh, it became apparent to me what a walk-on was. And a walk-on was someone at A&M that wore a green jersey. So scholarship athletes wore maroon jerseys. A walk-on had your tape name, Caldwell in my case, on my helmet. The scholarship athletes did not have tape on their helmets because the play coaches knew their names. You get the picture? That created a great sense of, uh, hmm, great sense of anger in me and a great determination as well. And um, because of that, I became very determined to get out of that green jersey. And that became the pursuit of my life and the purpose of my life. I made that my purpose. And by the way, I had no close personal relationship with God at all. Had never made a decision to follow Christ. I, I just, I knew God as a kind of a foreign, distant figure, and I knew the church. But no relationship whatsoever with me. I became very determined, and uh, uh, sophomore year uh, actually played. And uh, spring of my sophomore year, the coach at that time stopped practice in spring practice and said, Call, we'll take off that green jersey and put on a maroon jersey. One of the highlights of my life, I tell you, at that time, it couldn't have been anything better. And Coach Wilson did that, and the players were clapping and hollering. And, and it was a, it, one of those just amazing moments in someone's life. But I can tell you, that because of the fight that I was in, it didn't, you know, there was a little bit of joy and a little bit of happiness, but, you know, I became more resolved to work even harder and to become a starter on that football team. And boy, I tell you, it just became one kind of goal after the next to work harder and harder and harder. And you know what? Those things kind of happened. And the things that I set happened, I worked harder and harder and 
And I was determined I was going to do well in school because I know my mother would be very unhappy if I didn't do well in school. So I had to do well in school and I had to do well in football. And I did that to the exclusion of everybody else. I had a horrible relationship with my girlfriend because I never had time for her. I had time for three things that I used to tell her very clearly is to tell her that I, why I don't have time for you. I had time for three things, weights, football, and school. That was my life, my purpose, weights, football, school. If it got anywhere outside that, I didn't have time for my teammates. I didn't have time for anybody else. Weights, football, school, that was it. And you know what? It served me. I, all the goals I set kind of happened. And... Uh, However, some things for our team didn't happen. Our team didn't perform well. Well, in my fourth year, at the end of my fourth year, uh, our head coach was fired. Now it's going to be the third head coach came in, Jackie Sherrill. Coach Sherrill came in my fifth year, and I had graduated and started a master's degree in finance at A&M, and I didn't know anything about that, but I said, I'll just sign up for a full load. I can handle it. And uh, so I took a full load in uh, graduate school and started my fifth year playing football. Jackie Sherrill put us through three a days at two at, at, uh, at uh, uh, the fall that year, uh, Coach Sherrill, and, uh, who's a great man uh, and a dear friend of mine as well. But, you know, by, I tell you, by the end of that fifth year, and uh, I'd been a starter for a couple years at that point, I just simply ran out of gas. You ever had that feeling? You've been running so hard, you just, I just ran out of gas. And I'll never forget against TCU, I took a playoff, which means I didn't give 100%. It's the first time I can ever remember doing that. The only time I ever remember doing that in college, I took a playoff, and my left knee got planted to the ground. That's why I limped today. And uh, Rob McKee, my friend over here, keeps telling me i got to have that knee replaced, which I do need to have it replaced. But it happened because I took a playoff, and my knee got planted to the ground. I got pushed backwards, tore every ligament but my left knee. But an amazing thing, when I was laying on, my, on the field at Kyle Field looking up Bluebird Day, um, I was relieved. It was over. I mean, everything finally stopped for the moment. And that uh, pursuit was over, and I got a sense of relief. But no real sense of joy or purpose. Just that it was over. And, uh, but I'll tell you, when it happened, I knew I'd never play football again. I knew any hopes I had of playing after college, et cetera, that was over with and done. There was no question about that. Shortly after college, Susan and I got married. We moved to Houston, and uh, instead of going to work for the banks and the accounting firms like all my friends, I went to work for Susan's father's uh, home construction company and land development firm out in Northwest Houston. Put on the jeans and boots and went out there and worked construction sites. All my friends were going downtown in their suits. I was out on construction sites out in Northwest Harris County building stuff. Kind of a green jersey feeling, uh, I can tell you. And it started over again. I felt like here we go again. You know, maybe those of you in the old business, I guess that'd be like out working on, the, working on a rig. You know, that was kind of the job I had. And, uh, and I really felt like, you know what, something is wrong with this picture. You know, I've done this green jersey deal before. I said, I know I can work my way out of it. I've done it before. But last time it ended up in total disaster. And I tell you, and I don't know if it was some TV evangelist or what it was, but there was a point in there in the mid-80s where I just at one point said, okay, I've done it my way, and I'm done doing it my way. And I got down on my knees one day, and I said, Lord, I'm going to follow you, Jesus Christ, and I don't know what that means. I don't even know what that looks like. But I can tell you what I've done hasn't worked. And I tell you, at that moment, God began to heal me from just an emptiness that lived inside me and began to change me and transform me in something that's still happening today and will be happening for till I breathe my last breath on this earth as he continues to mold and shape me. You see, I determined that my purpose was directly tied somehow to God's purpose. And I didn't understand it at the time. But somehow my purpose here had more to do when it, with, than just obtaining goals and objectives in the next thing that I could accomplish, the next accolade, the next award, whatever it was, that there was something more than that. In 1990, uh, I told Susan I needed to start, needed, to, I'd worked, I'd changed, I'm going to work for a developer. I said, I need to change. I can't do this. I need to start my own company. I don't know why. I just told her that. And she was pregnant with our second child, and uh, we had a two-year-old. And we had no savings to speak of. 
and uh, but she knew how kind of just what I was doing didn't fit, and she, being a wonderful support, said, you need to go do that, and so we did that. And uh, then we started our business in 1990, and, uh, and I can tell you, because just um, the way I'm wired or whatever, but I work like crazy, stupid hours, probably like a lot of you have done in your business careers, but something was different this time. Something was different, even though I worked and wasn't home a lot. I knew that God had a greater purpose and, and um, a, a pastor at a church we had joined began to disciple me and walk alongside me and began to shepherd me. And although the business was very important and it was, it was very important that we did well in that, but um, this man began to get me, he got me into some, he got me into the Bible. I never read the Bible. I read parts of the Bible, I never read the Bible you know what I mean and he got me into the Bible and I began reading that and it began to make sense for me that God had even greater plans for me and then something else happened a friend of mine sponsored me to go to this place out in the middle of nowhere Northern California called J.H. Ranch anybody been to J.H. Ranch here in this we got one J.H. Ranch is an awesome ministry non-denominational nothing to do with a particular church or anything, but it's a parent teen ministry. I went out there because I wanted to do the best thing for my child. And lo and behold, I found God out there in a big way, had a message for me. And uh, it was life changing and transformational. It's the first time I ever heard the concept of the dimin law of diminishing returns as it relates to our life. And some of you may be familiar, if you've been in business, the law of diminishing returns. I'm going to describe how that works and how it works in terms of our spiritual needs. Um, we have this little place in Brenham. And when it's really hot in the summer, there's a place, actually any time, summer or winter, for us anyway, there's an Exxon gas station there at the intersection of 36 and 290. If you're going to Austin ever, you know what I'm talking about. It's called Scoops. You can buy gas or you can buy Bluebell ice cream. And... Uh, I'm going to tell you a crazy thing. They have the best Bluebell ice cream ever, by the way. I mean, it's just, I think it's right out of the factory. They must run a truck over there every day. It's phenomenal. But, you know, you have that first scoop of Bluebell ice cream. It is unbelievable. Pick on a hot summer day. You go in there and some of that Bluebell vanilla with a little chocolate sauce on it, and it's like, wow, so good. Get an, if you get two big scoops. By the second scoop, it's not as good as it was. And if you could eat three of those things, I'm telling you, you would just be laying on the, you, you know, you know, I'm not sure how, but you'd be really sick, right? You see, the more we consume, the less it fulfills. And I want you to think about something. That is true of everything in life. Everything in life, the law of diminishing returns applies to. Food, you know, accumulation, all of it. The more you have of it, the less it fulfills. And there's only one exception. You know what it is? God. I have found that to be absolutely true in my life. The more I pursue God and the more I consume of his word and understand about him, the more he fulfills. Now, I've been on this 25-year journey, and he continues to be my fulfillment in greater quantity but everything else the more I have of it the less it fulfills everything else and there's not anything outside that law I don't think one of my favorite stories in the Bible because I can relate so much to this guy is Simon and I don't know if you remember that story but it kinda goes like this Andrew, Simon's brother, introduces him to Jesus, who Andrew had just met, and says, you've got to meet this guy, Jesus. And I'm sure he said something like, I think he may be the Messiah. And Jesus, upon meeting Simon for the first time, says, I'm going to give you a new name, Cephas, or Peter the Rock, upon which I'll build my church. Now, Peter had no clue what that meant at the time, but that's what Jesus told him. So I'm going to give you a new name. And then later, 
Peter, and by the way, Peter is a fisherman, and he's the CEO of his company. He's the big guy. And he's got all his guys out there, and they've been fishing all night, and they caught absolutely zippo, zero. The, the pros, they caught nothing. And Jesus came along, and he had these people that were following him, and they wanted to hear from him, and they were pressing up against the shore of this lake. And, and Jesus saw Simon, Peter, and said, Hey, can I borrow your boat? And Simon had met him and said, yeah, I'll borrow my boat. You see, Simon didn't know Jesus a lot, but he knew him enough to let Jesus use his platform, his boat. And I'm telling you, in the marketplace, God's calling us to use our platforms for his purpose. God's calling us to allow Jesus in the boat. You know, I don't know if you remember anything I say today, but remember that. God wants to use the platform. He's, he gave it to you. It's not yours anyway. It's just on loan. You know, everyone in here, 100% guarantee every one of you are going to die. And I guarantee you this, 100%, none of you are taking any of this stuff with you. It's on loan. You know, we're just passing through. You know, we're just passing through. Anyway, Peter lets him go, uses the boat. Jesus does his talk deal, gets off, comes back. Peter looks at, uh, Jesus looks at Peter and his guy says, go out, back out, and throw your nets on the other side. Now, they were, they'd fished all night and didn't catch anything. And you know the rest of the story. They throw the nets on the other side where they catch more fish than can they put in a boat. They have to cut, throw another boat out there. And what does Peter do? He falls to his knees in guilt and shame and says, I'm a sinful man. Forgive me. And Jesus says this to him. He says, drop your nets. Two words, follow me. I'll make you a fisherman, I'll make you a fisher of men. Follow me. Jesus did not say to any of the disciples, I want you to be highly religious. He said to no disciples, I want you to be religious. In fact, he said nothing about religion. And if you study Jesus, what you'll see is that he was against the religious of his day. Jesus was against the highly religious of his day. That's who he was against, directly opposed to. He didn't care about religion. Jesus cared about relationship, and it really mattered. So this calling of Peter was critical, and I think it's such a great story because it's a reminder that Jesus is interested in a relationship with us. He's not interested in our religion. It does not mean anything to God, our religion. It's all man-made. What he cares about is our faith in him. And then, you know the rest of the story? Peter... The Last Supper, Jesus, who's about to be crucified, he knows what's coming. He says, all of you will betray me. What does Peter say? Impetuous Peter, what's he say? I'll never betray you. I'll never disown you. I'll die with you. And Jesus, I think, Jesus, I, I, I'd love, I wish we had some, like, of the pictorial, you know, just descriptive. I just can see Jesus shaking his head and saying, you have no clue, Peter. You have no clue. And what does Peter do? Denies him how many times? Three times. After the resurrection and after Jesus has appeared to the disciples, and Peter has seen that, Peter is so filled with guilt, he can't even face up to You know what he does? He says to his guys, I'm going fishing. Now, on a, you might say, well, he's just trying to get away, but let me tell you what he was saying. I'm going back to work. I can't face the guilt that I feel right now for having rejected Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm going back to the office. I don't know about you, but I've had days like that. I'm just going to work. This life stuff is really hard. I'm going back to work. And then he fishes all night. Some of his guys went with him. They fish all night. How much they catch? Again, Zippo, zero. They caught nothing all night. And they see a figure on the, on the shore of the lake who's over there cooking breakfast. <laughs> and he calls to them and says, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. Sound familiar, Peter? For some of you today, God's telling you to throw your nets on the other side of the boat. I threw my net on the wrong side of the boat for a long time. 
a really long time. And it left me empty. It left the boat empty of my life. For some of you, I promise you today, God's, there's a reason you're here. And for some of you, I guarantee you, God's saying, throw your net on the other side of the boat and try that out. Trust me. Peter heard that. He jumps in the water, clothes and all, swims to the shore, sees Jesus. He can't believe that God would be so gracious to accept him who denied Jesus. He can't believe God's grace. And here's the part that's so convicting to me. And maybe to some of you today. I think it's the whole pivot point of Jesus' interaction with Peter. He asked him a simple question. And I've been studying these words for the last month because they just, they just convict me so much. As they've got those fish laid out, and Jesus cooked them breakfast of fish, it says. Okay? Jesus says, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? What, what God is saying, do you love your work more than me? Do you love fishing more than me? That was Jesus' question to Peter. You see, this whole idea of certainty, I think, is directly tied to our purpose and why are we here. And I guarantee that every one of you have a great purpose of God. Every one of us has a great purpose and calling from God. And our work is not our purpose. Our work is not our purpose. It's a platform. It's a boat. But ultimately, it's a platform for God. It's God's platform. I've got, um, being an Aggie, I have to have a We'll close with this. I have four things for you to think about in terms of defining your purpose. Four things. And it's an, I have an acronym. I was going to say, being an Aggie, I have to have acronyms to remember stuff because I can't remember stuff. So it's A-C-T-S, ACTS. Okay? And the A, the A is acknowledge God's call in your life. Acknowledge and accept God's call on your life. I promise you, Jesus comes to, to each of us each day and says, follow me. Each day, follow me today. Acknowledge and accept. And you know what helps me too is thinking back about where God has intercepted so amazingly, where, where it's just not coincidence that I can look back and think, okay, God put all these things together and there's just no probability that would have happened. And I write those things down and I've got a list of them. I call them God waypoints, like on the GPS system, God waypoints. And they remind me of God's sovereignty in my life because I have a tendency to forget that. I have a tendency to want to operate out of my own power. C, commit yourself to God's word and to prayer. I start each day, I go in my study each day, I get down on my knees and I pray and I read God's word. And you know what I call that? I call that being coached up. Now, who would want to go play a game and at the end of the game go to the coach and say, hey, we just want to see what you thought of the game we played if we actually called the plays you might have called, even though you knew the whole, you did all the study of the opposing team, you knew all the things that were going to happen out there. Who wants to go to the coach after the game and say, now I'm just curious what you would have called because I didn't ask you to start the game. I believe in starting the game of each day with God. Because he already knows what's going to happen. He knows what defense are running out there. He knows the defense and the offense. He knows what's being run out there. I want to start the day and hear from him. And every day I write down some application that he's telling me for that day to apply. I just kind of graze on his word. He stops me. I read that. I write it down. That's the application. Commit to God's word and to prayer. T, thanks, be a thanksgiver. We're called in scripture to live a life of thanksgiving. Be thankful. You know, these guys over here, I was with a few last week. That's a group of men that are highly thankful. And, and being around them was a blessing to me because I'm reminded of our call to be thankful. 
And the other part of that thanksgiving word is be a giver. You know, if you want to get out of this materialistic culture we live in, the only way to do it is to pry these things open and recognize that it's not ours. It's on loan. And what do you do with it to help someone? How do you help other people by getting, letting go of it? You know, the most healing thing you can do is let go of some of this stuff and use it to help someone else. Thanksgiving. Be a thanksgiver. And the S, surround yourself with people that will hold you accountable and that will raise you up. You know, I am so blessed to be married to a godly woman who I can share anything with, and Susan gives me such great, she has such better discernment than I do. She can read people better than I can. She just, I I am so blessed by that, and I suspect those of you that are married, you, you have a similar opportunity in your spouse. I'm so blessed to work with a great group of people right here, these guys and a bunch of others back at our office that really care about doing the right thing and doing things with a godly purpose. And I'm blessed to get to work with these guys every day. They hold me accountable and they can tell you how much I screw things up on a regular basis. And yet they keep me kind of moving down the right path. And finally, I think it's important to have friends and other men. These guys over here, we had my old ball coach, R.C. Slocum, was with us on that trip. Uh, I tell you, he's, he's, he's one of the best men I've ever known. Uh, he's a strong, faithful man, Christian, principled man that has, you know, he's somebody I can call any day of the week and say, Coach, what would you do here? I've got this issue, you know. Same with these guys over here. You know, have people in your life that you can call and talk to that can guide you in the right way that is not just of the world but has godly purpose and perspective. Acts. I, um, I just want to encourage each of you again. I, it's no accident. I, I don't even know. I didn't, I, Rob told me he was coming. I had no idea. I don't even know how he heard about it. And I see John here. And I say, all these guys, I didn't know they were going to be here. And some other people talking, I don't even know how you heard about this thing. Um, But it's no coincidence. And I didn't really know what I was going to say at this, but God really led me to particularly talk about Peter and about purpose and about his call for our life today. I don't think that's any accident. Could have talked to you about the real estate business, about the development business, how great Houston is, and this best city in the I mean, I could give you the Chamber of Commerce speech. That's not what God put on my heart to talk to you about today. Every one of us are on a different journey. Every one of us are a different place. If God can accept someone like Peter and Paul, and so, you know what I love about the great men and women of faith in the Bible? is none of them were perfect. I mean, you look at David, he had messed up family issues, dysfunctional family. You look at Peter, I mean, the guy's hot, he's cold, he's all over the map. Paul persecuted the church, murdered Christians. A murderer, can you imagine a murderer who wrote most of the New Testament? God spoke through him, a murderer. It ought to give us hope. It's not about religion, it's about relationship, and it's about following uh, Christ, follow me. And uh, so I encourage any of you, if you've not made that decision, it starts there, and it's a journey, and uh, uh, I'm just so thankful to be on that path, and uh, uh, so thankful that all of you are here, and I'm thankful for your friendship and your counsel and your guidance, and uh, uh, it's a blessing to be uh, with each of you today. I'd like to close us in a prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your time uh, that you brought these people together, Lord. Uh, Thank you for what's happening here at Houston Baptist and through the business school and the desire to promote Christian principles in particular, Lord, that uh, Jesus would be proclaimed in the marketplace uh, boldly and and unashamedly, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll give us that boldness and conviction as we walk out of here today. In Christ's name, amen.